Today is made possible with support of the provincial and federal governments, Ontario Federation of Agriculture and its partnership with Ag Careers and CareersandFood.com, launching the Feed Your Future program, delivering essential areas to support employers and job seekers and really assisting them to navigate with the employment market that has been affected by COVID-19. We're happy to bring a concierge service for job seekers, employers, virtual career fairs, and today's webinar. So each of the webinars are uh, presented by an industry professional and designed to keep you up to date on the changing trends that are developing in the food and agriculture industry as it affects employment. And you will have the opportunity today to submit questions through the question and answer panel. So if you do have questions, please ask and we will be sure to direct those to our speaker. We're very pleased today to welcome our webinar presenter on agri-food workplace safety and learning the basics, Dean Anderson. So thanks for being with us today, Dean. Dean is the Strategic Advisor in Agriculture Initiatives for the Workplace Safety and Prevention Services, so WSPS. Dean has his BSc from University of Guelph in Ontario, and he has experience conducting research and project management in crop protection. He's also worked with major crops in the agriculture region of Eastern and Western Canada and throughout the United States. He has worked in agriculture, occupational health and safety for over 18 years and is currently the strategic advisor for agriculture and initiative at the WSPS, as I mentioned. So thank you, Dean, for being with us and covering some of the basics in regards to the agri-food workplace and keeping, obviously, these job seekers and staff members safe by learning the basics. So I'll turn it over to you and we appreciate you being here today. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we'll just move through the slides. Um, do I need, to, there we go, one. Um, so as she said, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. I have been working in occupational health and safety actually for almost 20 years now. Um, so I hopefully I can give you, today's going to be, as the title says, learning the basics. Uh, it's a topic uh, presentation that is really aimed at people wanting to become employed or new employees in the sector. Um, but it's also a good refresher for employers about what types of things they need to cover um, with their uh, new or, or employees they're trying to hire. So um, some of the things they want to do is, um, the first thing I want to do is make sure that um, everyone's aware going into a workplace um, of the hazards they could be exposed to. Um, the statistic in Ontario, I will not bore you with statistics, um, but here's the one that I want you to remember that on average, about 42 young people are injured on the job every day in Ontario. That's all sectors. Um, so with like over 4 million workers in the province, um, 42 are young people. And we know that new people to the job, so not just young, new people have a much higher propensity to have an accident early on in their employment. And most cases it's because they haven't been trained properly or they haven't been paying attention to what they were trained on and um, uh, they have inexperience in recognizing and avoiding the hazards. So um, one of the, so that's one of the first things they need to know that, um, that everybody has the right to know, everybody has the right to uh, a good safe workplace and then as this slide says here, um, what you don't, what you do know can save your life. It's the same thing as what you don't know can actually uh, take your life or get you injured. Um, you need to be able to recognize hazards. We've simply done them here by showing some signs. Um, these are signs that could be found actually in almost any farm, believe it or not. Um, but people need to understand what the signs are and know where their hazards are um, and uh, by knowing hazards, you can dramatically reduce the risk just by knowing how to work around things. Uh, if you can think of you know, these signs, employees only, there's probably a strong reason why the employer is recommending that no one go in there 
Um, one of the reasons could be it's hazardous gases. There may be other signs. Um, but by simply saying no one goes in here, um, it also limits uh, visitors from going into those kind of places, et cetera. That's a sign that we're seeing a lot of now with COVID also. Try and click. There we go. That was a bit quicker. Um, workplace hazards. Um, it's the employer's job to try and control hazards. Um, hazards have a simple definition, as this wheel says, physical, chemical, biological. MSDs are muscle skeletal disorders ergonomics, pains and strains, psychosocial, that's um, all revolving around all a lot of issues we have now with people dealing with sexual harassment, violence in the workplace, and then obviously things specifically around distinctly safety issues, um, PPE and those kind of things, and not following and sharing along with those kind of things. Um, so things you need to know. The first thing, we're going to get into the law. Often this whole discussion ends up becoming very boring because you end up talking about the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And uh, as an employer, everyone should be aware of it. Um, in farming, we have been under the act since 205. Um, and uh, in that, we haven't had a lot of regulations brought down with it, but we have had the act. And the act does have several components to it. And uh, it does um, give the legal right to protect your own health and safety as a worker. And it also has protections for the employer. Uh, the Ontario government did this. Actually, the, the agriculture industry worked with the Ministry of Labor in doing so. And uh, it was very important to understand. Um, one of the things that I often like to say at this point in time, just for everyone's knowledge, is it's any paid worker in the province. So that's someone who's paid a wage, a salary, um, a benefit. Uh, family farms, i.e. a father and son dairy farm, may not actually be under the Occupational Act unless they have a hired person because the father and son are probably members of the corporation. Um, but co-op students are covered. Um, foreign temporary workers are all covered under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. They're all paid a wage. Um, family farms becomes a bit more of an issue because you are allowed as a family uh, member to have your own horse, have your own calf for your calf club and not be considered a worker. Um, parents are allowed to pay their kids an allowance um, for doing chores around the farm. Um, I, the one thing I try and say is that if you think you're replacing a hired person by working seven hours a day on the farm, it's probably better for dad to consider you an employee and, uh, and actually buy compensation because it is actually a very good form of insurance if an injury does occur. Um, it, it's, it's not an insurance, it's a compensation system. So if it's a very serious injury, there's much better coverage under WSIB than there is with normal insurances. So uh, just like to cover that one off. Um, one of the things that farming coming under the act did is um, three main rights were instilled with the act and uh, people need to make themselves aware of these and understand them. I'm not going to go into huge detail on them today, but they are the basis of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Every worker, everyone in a workplace has the right to know. And in that right to know, um, it's what the dangers are, what can hurt you, how to work safely. Um, part of the role of the worker is to ask a lot of questions. Part of the role of a supervisor and an employer is to make sure they, they can answer the questions properly and sure people know what they're doing. Um, the right to participate is um, also the right, especially in larger workplaces, it's the right to uh, uh, report um, hazards to your supervisor, um, to report them to joint health and safety committees if they're larger firms, um, those types of things. So it's actually understanding and, and recognizing hazards and reporting them. And then the final right that was given under the Occupational Health and Safety Act is the right to refuse. Um, in reality, it means that if you believe the job is likely to endanger you, you can refuse to do it in most situations. But you will need to work with the employer um, to ensure that it's not just your misunderstanding of the job or just refusing it because you don't like that part of the job. Um, refusing to do it, um, it is also for some jobs in the province um, sort of considered a part of the job. So if you are a firefighter or a police officer, there are inherent dangers in a job like that that um, 
because you've been hired as a police officer, um, you can't um, refuse um, to go to do what you need to do to rescue someone, for example, in a fire, um, as long as your training and the equipment you do allows you to do it correctly. But in the farm workplace or most industrial locations, there are proven ways to do things and ways to protect yourself. Guarding, understanding guarding, understanding PPE, understanding policies and procedures are very important. Um, but you can't be disciplined for trying to understand your workplace and um, exercising your right. You do need to be responsible in trying to figure it out. So the example I used with Catherine earlier was just simply you might be worried that you're going to injure yourself because what you're being lifting is too big for you and it takes two people. So just working it with through your supervisor and saying, I think two of us should do this job um, might seem very reasonable, especially if you're smaller in stature. Not everybody is a big college football player. Um, so uh, it's not unsafe because you're just lifting a bag, but it would put your back at a problem. But if two people lifted and lifted correctly, it may not be unsafe. So it's a simple concept of, of that idea. Um, this slide goes into lots more detail. Um, Ministry of Labor, if they did get called, one of the first questions they will ask is, did you talk to your supervisor? So right here, if you can see my mouse, um, did you talk to your supervisor and see if you could fix the problem? If you can fix the problem or answer your solutions, you can move on. Um, if you don't, you work your way down through it. Eventually, if it does get to a point where you and your supervisor can't, um, the Ministry of Labor will come in and help you sort it out. Um, and generally that's what they do is they make the workplace sorted out, but they act a bit as like a moderator. So I'm not gonna stress much more on that. <clears throat> uh, the law requires that the employer and the supervisor, and I think the supervisors are actually very important. Um, supervisor can be your employer, but it's the person who actually supervises your activity. So as a worker, it's the person you would consider your boss. It's the person that says, okay, everybody, we're gonna take a break. Oh, it's too hot, we're gonna go take a break. Um, we're sort of done right now, let's take lunch 15 minutes early. Um, oh, it's pouring rain, we're gonna call it a day. And that could be your employer, but it's usually a manager or a supervisor. Um, and uh, the, you have the responsibility as, as a worker to make sure you're following their orders and directions. So as long as they're telling you to do things that are safe, it is a responsibility to follow what they are telling you um, because the assumption is, is that they're telling you how to do it in a safe manner. And if you um, ignore that direction, then um, you could be putting yourself into much bigger danger. So, so Dean, just a uh, question is come yep. in in respect to what are, and I, I, this is great that people are asking because this is sure. kind of the conversation. What are some of the most common workplace accidents in the agriculture or food setting and how can they be prevented? Our, our most common injury is actually um, ergonomics, so muscle skeletal. And if you think of it, um, there's a lot of manual labor. So it's a lot of um, awkward position, overexertion, um, repetitive motion. Um, after that, our, if, if you want to go to the opposite end of that, um, fatalities, about half our fatalities are tractor related. About half are rollover, half are runover. Um, and then about... Um, 16 to 20% are entanglements in equipment. And believe it or not, large animal then becomes our next biggest issue. And that would be um, beef, uh, dairy, uh, swine, and horses. We have uh, about a third of them are horses, believe it or not. Um, and so that would be a breeding operation, not a horse training or a boarding stable. Um, but those are the most common um, causes of the accidents. Um, generally in agriculture, our orders that are written tend to be orders that are just written under the act, which is a general due diligence clause, which is a 25-2-H. And that is, did you take every reasonable precaution to protect the worker? And reasonable means that my wife, who's an arts grad, looks at it and goes, that doesn't look safe. Because <laughs> um, remember, it's a judge who's going to be judging this if it gets to court. Um, and so it needs to be, does the judge think that stepping over a PTO is a safe activity? And most people would look at the activity of stepping over a PTO and say, that does not look safe. Um, so it, I, I don't know if that totally answers the question, but um, 
probably half our actual injuries or off the job are related to that muscle skeletal. So overexertions, repetitive motion, um, and awkward positioning. Um, and so, if you think of it, think of a dairy farmer and they all got bad knees, right? Right. Or, or on a processing line for poultry, having the right ergonomics and being aware of not, not being at the right height, not having right. a sharp boning knife, um, lifting mushrooms in a mushroom barn, um, with your hands in an upright position instead of to the sides. You know, I, I don't know if you're looking at my picture, this would be the way to pick something up, not this way. Um, those kind of things all lead to those kind of injuries. Um, and believe it or not, we're very good at working with our injuries in agriculture, but when we finally herniate our back or fracture um, something else, we tend to be off the job longer than other people. Um, but if it's a break and you can get a walking cast on, people get back out there and start milking the cow again or doing what they can do or get a wrist um, cast on. And we're very good at getting back to work quickly. Um, I think it's good work ethic. Sometimes it's not the best thing for the healing. But. Right now. Okay. Well, I'll let you keep going. We have other questions, but honestly, some of them I think can wait because I okay. know you have some of this information covered. Yeah, I may, I may have some of them covered. And if so, then we won't ask the question. Oh, we can review the question at the end. It doesn't matter. Um, so the employer's responsibilities, um, click the button, Dean. Um, the employer's responsibilities are relatively simple. Um, you've got to provide a safe health and safety training. Um, you provide proper equipment and training. Um, tell you and your supervisor about any of the hazards and take every precaution reasonable to protect the worker. And um, those are all relatively simple things. Uh, when it comes down to the end of it, um, Ministry of Labor loves to see things in writing. So I always recommend that if you do do a training day, have a checklist and check things off as you're going down the list. Um, and uh, the biggest thing is the Ministry of Labor will still always go to the workers and ask them questions. So that when it comes in the case of a Ministry of Labor inspector comes in, they're, they're not going to care as much about your training as much as do the workers know what they should be doing. Um, in agriculture, we tend to do a lot of our training by showing um, and uh, documenting that you've done it is becomes your proof and that helps you with your due diligence. If the workers don't learn it when you do your training, it wasn't effective training. And what the ministry will usually do is order you to go back and retrain um, and or chain, train your. And so one of the issues we've had with COVID, for example, is people putting on and taking off their face masks properly. There's proper procedures to make sure you don't infect yourself because your hands could be um, dirty, for example. So um, getting a video that shows that may be better than you doing it because you're not an expert in PPE, donning and doffing as an example. Supervisors, as I say, I think supervisor and employer could be the same thing in a small workplace. Supervisor is the one who manages your day to day. If you look at this, they tend to be the same thing as the employer, although one is make sure you're following the company safety rules where the employer needs to make sure the rules are in place as the example. Make sure that you work safely and use the required equipment. They're overseeing you. So if they say you need steel toed shoes as a worker, it's the supervisor's responsibility to make sure you're doing it. And if not, they need to correct that measure. And so it's the same thing as, as now with COVID, which is a good example. If they, if they do require a mask in the workplace, which most are doing now, if you can't socially distance, it would be the supervisor's responsibility to make sure you do it. It is also the responsibility to make sure that you've got access to that safety equipment. Um, so similarly, if there's an, a guard and a guard's been removed, you should report it to your supervisor. Your supervisor's then responsible to make sure it's in place. Um, and ultimately, um, they're, they're the ones who, if they see you doing something wrong, um, unsafe, uh, it would be the supervisor's responsibility to go back and say, um, you need to go back to what I told you doing. We do it this way because it's safer. So most supervisors, most workplaces don't put rules in places unless it's there um, to uh, improve the safety or the quality of their product. So some rules obviously in the workplace are around quality of product, other rules are around safety in the workplace. Um, this, this talk was, um, didn't work, uh, this talk was aimed at um, 
people looking to work in the sector. Um, so this, and it looks like there's a whole bunch of responsibilities here, but it's one of those things I always try and stress is the Occupational Health and Safety Act doesn't just say the employer is responsible for everything. The worker's responsible um, for their own actions and their own activities also. So the first one there is comply with the law um, and the company's health and safety rules. So as I say, if you're someone who's working in um, let's say uh, a fruit industry, they may say no hand jewelry. So no rings, no bracelets, no anything like that. Um, and the reason would be is as a quality of the product, they don't want a ring to show up in someone's kitchen when they open the package. Um, but they also don't want someone to eat <laughs> the ring <laughs> in the food. Um, but the other one is it's to protect you because the ring could get caught on a piece of moving equipment and uh, there are a lot of people who are missing fingers and or parts of fingers or use of fingers because such things as rings have gotten caught on moving equipment. Um, my wife gets angry at me. I have a wedding ring. I don't wear it because every once in a while I'm using pieces of equipment. Instead of trying to take it off, I just leave it off. Um, she's learned to live with that. Um, all machine and equipment uh, are meant to be used in a safe way. This includes um, shutting equipment off or locking them out. Uh, the simple example I use is uh, it's, it's not how you do it, it's how you disable it and do it as a practice. So if you take a meat slicer in a deli shop, you can get a, a lockout that goes over the end of a plug and unplug it and put that lock on it. But I've heard of people where their policy was you unplug the meat the meat slicer and you put the plug from the extension cord in your front pocket of your pants. No one else can plug that piece of equipment in while you're working on it. So it's what your policy and procedure is, is what you need to follow and how you're trained to do it. Um, just unplugging it and leaving it there is not a good practice because someone may go, oh, that's unplugged. Um, and uh, the you know, worst case scenario is you're in a grain bin and someone turns on a grain auger as an example. Um, Use of protective equipment is also your responsibility. So if you're told to wear hearing protection, you should wear hearing protection. Um, report any hazards you see. So often what happens is a guard gets broken or something. You should report that to someone so that they can get it fixed. Um, some things need to be fixed immediately. Some things probably could go without being fixed till the next day or till you get the part. So a turn signal may, a light bulb may not be working. That's important if you're driving on the road. It may not be as critical to the day's activity if you're out driving in the middle of a hayfield. Um, so reporting it to your boss and then sorting through how we're going to fix it. Are we going to stop work? Do we fix it? Or are we going to plan to fix it? And uh, always work safely and don't play games. Horse play actually is not allowed under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And uh, there have been a number of people get injured, i.e. playing on forklifts or bobcats or ATVs and rolling, for example, and people getting injured. And the first thing that people would do during an investigation was look into see whether they were using the piece of equipment properly. And if they were, um, definitely the, and, and the supervisor didn't know it, the supervisor won't be charged, but definitely the employee could be charged and especially if another worker is injured. So the worker has the responsibility to follow these parts of the act. Just looking at time. Okay, we're not doing bad. Um, training. Uh, what can you expect? So this question obviously goes to the worker, but um, your employer and your supervisor has to inform you to do your job, to how to do your job, the training and how to use equipment and how you need to protect yourself. Um, as I said earlier, uh, we often do an awful lot of training by demonstrating or showing. Um, a good supervisor will always work the safety into that discussion. So if it is around moving uh, let's say bags of seed, um, they will also try and work in um, such things as proper lifting technique. Bending at the knees, keeping your back straight, um, not twisting, um, those kind of things. Um, if they're using pruning shears in a grape orchard, it'll be how to use the sharps, how to carry the sharps when you're going out of the field, the pruning, the, the pincers as you're going in and out of the field. Um, I've, I've heard of people, you know, putting the long handled ones in their rubber boots and walking and then they fall and it's the things down beside them and guess what they fall on? Um, the pruning shears. Um, so it's, uh, it's simple, a landscaper, of course, it becomes part of the quality control. So if you're planting a tree, you don't want to have to replant the tree, but you also need to understand how to lift the tree and move the tree. So I always think a good inspector, a good supervisor um, 
covers off both parts of that question. And at that point in time, they should also watch and make sure people follow the training properly and if they need to retrain or, or refresh. Um, you must report. So this is part of that part that was there before, but um, if you're injured, if you're sick, um, you should report it to your supervisor immediately. Um, there, there are several reasons for that. One is there may be a hazard or risk you aren't fully aware of and uh, you could have um, more serious injury from the injury than you were thinking about. So uh, the example I'll use there is sometimes people get trapped in grain up to their waist. They manage to get themselves out with the help of other people and they don't go for treatment and you can suffer from cap in caps um, capsulization and so because of the lack of flow of blood in your lower legs you can have then a huge stress hit your internal organs as that blood finally starts to flow again and you can collapse several hours after an accident um, you know the same thing would go with exposure to uh, silo gas um, often the symptoms of silo gas don't affect a mild case till the middle of the night and people wake up with like an ammonia type um, but the nitric gases and silo gas have now turned to nitric acid in the lungs and people need to be aware of. So that's why you'd report that to your supervisor, even though you seem fine, um, they may know that, well, we should send you to a doctor anyway. Um, and the simple thing is if you step on a rusty nail, maybe you should go for a tetanus shot. And your supervisor needs to know because depending on the injury, they need to report first aid and if it becomes a more serious injury, they are going to have to report by law to um, WSIB. And uh, if it is a serious thing like loss of consciousness or something like that or worse, they would have to report it to the Ministry of Labor also. So you have to let them know so the employer knows. That's basically what that says. Um, don't gamble with your safety. It's not a game. Help protect yourself. Um, this this one I think is is just general around the workplace. Uh, you need to report your injuries. You need to make sure you're trained. If you see hazards, report them. Know what your duties are. Know what your rights are. And uh, doing it in a safe way is always going to be the best way for us to get the job done in the long run. Um, most workplaces have been doing the job for a long time. They figured out the most efficient way to do it. Um, sometimes I hear of. Uh, young people trying to do it in a different fashion, maybe taking shortcuts. And the shortcuts are where equipment gets broken and people get injured. And um, sometimes you get loss of production and things like that. That's what most employers don't want. Injured workers, broken equipment or damage or loss of um, harvested equipment, uh, equi uh, produce. Um, so, uh, no one's going to get in trouble for asking or trying to protect the workplace, um, whether it's their own safety or the safety of equipment or produce. Um, most producers in agriculture, those are their three things that keep them up at night. Do I have good quality product? Am I going to have workers that don't get injured? And am, is my equipment going to be stay working all the way through harvest season as the example? So you can sort of see how work safety and and work efficiency and production tie together quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to go down through some examples here <clears throat> um, the, of what common workplace hazards are. I think this goes a little bit to the question that we had. Muscle skeletal disorders, you can see force is pulling, repetitive motion is that working on a sorting line as the example, and working in an awkward position, posture or position. Um, sometimes that's just short people need to have some sort of a step stool or something that can raise them up. Uh, the example in the picture here is someone lifting something that maybe is, you know, if that's a box of paper and you're a smaller person, that could be a, uh, you know, it could be easily 50 pounds. And that may be more than a smaller person, especially a youth, might be able to lift or not. So it's, that's what's, that is our most common, about 50% of the injuries that get claimed at WSIB are this type of, of injury. Most of them are um, dealable with. Um, you may have to do such things as, as an employer, stress stretching, um, stress the proper position. Um, if it's force, you might say, well, when we're doing this job, we take two people to do it. Uh, most of them could be um, circumvented if proper steps are taken in the workplace. Um, but often what happens is 
people get lax, people do things in bad positions. And the example I'll use, I work from home, I sit in a chair, I slouch sometimes, and my back gets sore. That's my fault for slouching. Um, sitting upright is my job as the employee. My, my employer makes sure that I've got my keyboard at the right height and my monitor at the right height, and I have a good ergonomic style chair. But how I sit in the chair is also an important component of that. Uh, 30 minutes. We're not doing bad for time. Um, in agriculture, some of our most serious injuries that are outside of equipment um, related um, is slips, trips, and falls. We tend to have cement floors um, in a lot of places like in greenhouses, in mushroom barns, um, dairy floors, any kind of livestock facility. Um, we tend to have it where we're sorting or, or doing quality control work on fruit and vegetables. And when floors get wet, um, they tend to get slippery. Um, so if it's around livestock and there's a bit of manure on the floor, they get slippery. One of the worst things I always say is um, mushroom is, uh, banana skin is not the big slipping hazard. A mushroom on a cement floor is a big slipping hazard. Um, and so housekeeping is very important. The picture here showing an extension cord dragging across the aura, just a plug left lying on the floor is also a problem. If that person's carrying something, you can tell they wouldn't be able to see the tripping hazard that was there. So housekeeping is very important to this one. Keeping the cement floor as clean as possible and dry during working. So if you can clean it sort of end of the day, so it's dry when you start the next day. Um, falling, believe it or not, we have more injuries from people falling on level or unlevel ground or below, let's say three meters. Um, we don't have a lot of falls from heights. So the picture of grain bins, um, people tend to, I think, just be very careful when they're climbing. Uh, a lot of the equipment nowadays has like a cage around it so the person can lean back on the cage and rest. Um, so the working at heights tends not to be our big problem. It's tripping and slipping. And the big problem is actually head injuries. Um, being a cement floor, being stalls around, being metal tables, sorting conveyors, um, stanchions, um, people fall and they hit their head. Um, so that tends to be the secondary part of slipping and tripping is it tends to be head injuries um, and or just broken arms or wrists or ankles. Um, just probably not being the best way to describe that, but that's where those ones come from. So helping people understand that motorized equipment is our big killer. Um, regretfully, it tends to be the serious accident period, it doesn't tend to be our hospitalizations. So such things as rolling a tractor, um, which used to be our number one injury, whether it's operating like the tractor on the right hand side in this picture, um, and then lifting the bale of hay too high, and it makes the tractor unstable in a fast sharp turn, um, or going on uneven ground. Um, forklifts are even worse, uh, making sure that truck has uh, got the wheels chalked so that the truck can't move away from the loading ramp. Um, those kind of things are always the problem. The other one is that we get a lot of runovers, but half our fatalities with tractors and moving equipment are actually bystanders being run over. So knowing who's around you, there's a lot of big blind spots. Children in the workplace um, probably make up a third of our runovers. The operator makes up about a third of our injuries. So they don't properly break the equipment. They get off to do something and the equipment moves. Um, it's on a slight slope or something and the person gets run over and crushed. Uh, the other one is on older tractors, people sometimes get lazy and bypass start the old screwdriver on the starter motor and uh, the tractor's in gear on the older tractors and uh, people often get pinned and run over that way. So. Um, that is half of our fatalities. It's actually down the list significantly on hospitalizations. They tend to be the more critical injuries we get. So training people around those hazards are important. Um, <clears throat> our number two cause of hospitalizations and number three cause of fatalities in agriculture are machinery, machinery entrapment. Um, the pictures here are maybe... Um, not directly related to agriculture, although you could think of a conveyor belt in one on the left and having um, unguarded um, gearing for the moving of the produce. 
Um, the other one is a good example. It's obviously got some caging that stops people from getting near the hazard. Um, normally in guarding, we would say that's a good way to protect the worker because it's engineered. Uh, the worker can't be in where the hazard is when the hazard's occurring. Um, as you move down the list of the hierarchy, the worst thing would be um, relying on Ke Kevlar gloves and uh, steel toes to protect the worker. And the reason for that is those can often fail because a person, for example, doesn't put gloves on when they're dealing with sharps. Um, so dealing with the sharps in some form of an engineered manner would be a much better way to do it. Um, but you can sort of think if you go through your workplace that um, probably about 16% of our fatalities are machine um, uh, entanglements. Um, probably about 20% of our hospitalizations um, are also because of machine entanglements. So they, people don't often, um, we get more of these and we get tractor rollovers, but people don't often die from machinery entanglements. They end up with maiming or serious injuries. And so protecting the worker and training them properly in these situations and asking questions on how to work is very important. Um, this slide's been in for a long time in discussions. Uh, this is where COVID would fit now. COVID is um, a, a virus, <laughs> so it fits in that German virus age. Um, we have a lot of bio issues, um, zoonotic diseases, um, you know, hoof and mouth, avian influenza, um, rabies, uh, you can keep going down the list of, of those kind of issues that we've had and hazards. Um, PPE tends to be a way that we do this, but good ventilation, um, wearing other materials, um, gloves, proper footwear, molds and toxins. If you're dealing especially around such things as we do get um, molds um, and spores in mushroom facilities. Um, we get molds around anywhere. There's obviously a lot of water sitting. Um, grains, you can get grain molds, grain dust molds, um, which sort of moves into the next one down. We do deal a lot with pesticides in parts of the sector um, and or cleaning solutions. So thinking on a dairy barn, uh, we use both acids and alkalines in cleaning milk stone and uh, staining and cleaning up around milk equipment. Fumes, um, we are notorious in, in the sector for having such things as hydrogen sulfide around manure, methane. Um, we've had several barn fires, for example. Um, carbon monoxide, running pressure washers inside buildings um, or in shops. Um, it takes very little time to start up a vehicle in a shop and not have open ventilation. And it literally, um, I talked to a guy who did work on snowmobiles and he said that his carbon monoxide sensor would go off within 15 seconds of starting a snowmobile in a closed shop, in his repair shop. Um, if he backed the machine up and put it near the door and opened the door halfway, he said he could run the snowmobile and it wouldn't set off his carbon monoxide. So just thinking of how you're doing it with fumes becomes very important. Um, and obviously silos and silo gases, if you're working around our crops in those facilities, we do have some silo gases um, that are also um, pretty toxic, as I say. Um, usually it's early on in the ensiling process, but making workers aware um, what they're looking at and listening to what they're smelling is an important feature. So if you do have an employee that sees something hazardous, hazardous, what is their rights? So if if the employee obviously views something that's hazardous, what do you recommend they do? I, I would say if they, it, the, the, the first thing they should do is try and talk to their supervisor, their employee, employer. They're the ones that control the workplace so that and it may be, if it's, for example, a guard missing, it may be a matter of getting the guard and putting the guard on before you progress. Um, if it's a practice or a procedure that you're not sure of what you're doing, then you should ask someone to show you again, ask and do it. Um, and, and from that one, and I think I've got it on a much later list here, but ask coworkers, ask the guy who's worked there for 30 years. Um, he may also not be the best resource because he may be doing it wrong, but he would know about the hazard and know what they've done about it and know what they should be doing around it. And uh, I think that um, worst case scenario, if you're not getting any satisfaction in the workplace, talk to your parent, 
um, when you go home at night, um, just say, you know, mom, I didn't feel really good doing this. And, and believe it, the, the angry grizzly bear mom will usually phone the employer up and say, um, John didn't feel good doing this today. Can you explain to me how he should be doing it? Or was he doing it wrong? Or are you going to be fixing that piece of equipment? Um, you know, those kind of questions. But in general, um, yes, there are some employers out there who don't concern themselves too much with safety, but safety ties so much to their business risk management. Mm -hmm. They can't, that they really can't afford to let obvious things slip mm -hmm. and, and they can't see everything. So you may be working in part of the job where he saw the, the place yesterday, but he didn't see it today and something broke, for example. Um, so that's your responsibility in the workplace to, you know, bring it up to someone else's attention. It's not your job to fix it. It's not your job to go get the duct tape <laughs> or the fencing wire and, and make it work because you may not be doing it properly either. So right. sure. um, if, if, if as a worker, you don't feel safe, you should ask the questions and that's that you have that right to refuse. And if it's something that's very obvious and keeps being obvious, you can involve the ministry of labor and yeah, your mom can phone and it's an anonymous phone call or dad <laughs> um, or your aunt or an older brother, or, or you can, it's anonymous. Um, they don't know who's calling. Um, the ministry have to respond to all complaints that are filed um, and they will treat them with anonymity. So they're going to go, we got a call. It could be the neighbor watching a bunch of kids working in the field in the middle of a hot day and notices they don't have any shade or cold water. <laughs> so it could just be the neighbor. Sure. Right? Sure. Okay. I'll let you keep going here. So I, I that think, was one that yep. I thought we might as, it was timely. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think I'm just about done. So we can open her up for questions if people want. Um, I want to go through this concept. Um, this is something that an employer should actually try and instill in the workers. This is something a worker should try and think as they go. So you started your first day of work and um, you've been told how to do things. And so before you start to do it, today or do it tomorrow, um, I ask people to go through this process of stop, think, and act. It's very simple. And I'm going to use the analogy of changing a light bulb. Um, most of us know that uh, when a light bulb breaks, the switch is probably still turned on. Um, most of us probably don't know that if you wire the switch wrong, the threads on the bulb could be charged before uh, the bulb's all the way in. So how you hold the bulb. Uh, most of us think of, um, do I do I have the right size bulb? Does the socket say it only takes a 60? All I have is a 100, so you shouldn't put the 100 in. And I'm starting to go through this think thing as I've stopped. Um, should I go to the circuit breaker and turn the switch off? Because I'm not sure which way the switch goes when it's on. Um, simple. We have had electricians die um, touching live wires, they didn't do the original wiring. So they've been an electrician for 20 years. They know how to wire a switch. The part they're touching should be safe. It's not because the person before wired it wrong. Um, so going to the circuit breaker and turning that the circuit breaker is the best way to do it. Should I stand on a chair or stand on a ladder? And now we've done the discussion, then think of how you should go forward and act. And it's your decision how you work forward, but at least you've gone through this process. And this could be anything. It could be um, driving a, a vehicle onto the roadway when you know the trailer lights aren't working is an example. That may not be bad during the day when everyone can see the vehicle lights, but at night and if the trailer's blocking the vehicle lights, then you really need your trailer lights on. The law would tell you, by the way, in either case, fix the lights. So stop. It's always think what could be the worst thing that could go wrong and how bad will it be? Um, clothing and shoelaces, could they get caught? Um, could they get caught in something and cause an injury? I.e., do your shoelaces up and you won't trip. Loose clothing, usually around um, sorting lines, et cetera, in our fruit and vegetable business, we would tell people don't wear loose clothing. Um, you know, think, do I clearly understand what I'm physically and am I physically and mentally ready? This is the old adage, yes, you can drive a combine 18 hours a day. Should you drive a combine 18 hours a day? <laughs> Are you mentally ready? Um, I always say um, most people can do it, but they need lots of breaks. Um, and I tell kids that if you're going back the laneway because grandpa's back doing something with equipment, um, take grandpa back his coffee for the afternoon or his cold drink. Make grandpa stop doing what he's doing and take a break with you while he does the drink. 
a rest is a good break and helps get your mentally, physically ready to go back to doing the job. Uh, a PTO spins quite fast, as people know, depends on the type of PTO. Um, literally, uh, if you have uh, a shoelace get caught in it, you've got about a second to react. And most cases you can't react. Um, it takes you about three seconds to walk around a tractor. Um, you need to do that 20 times in a day. That's only a minute. So thinking of how you um, react around a power takeoff, stepping over it, you could do it for 30 years and never have a problem. And then um, you have a loose thread on a pants, you have a, a shoelace gets caught and guess what happens? You're caught in it. So never stepping over the PTO would be the proper think on this one and slowing down and rushing that three or four seconds to walk around the tractor is not saving you a lot of time at the end of the day. You know, it's sort of the cop saying as you're driving at 50, uh, 60 and a 50, um, how much faster are you getting to work when it's only a 10 minute drive? You're going to get there less than a minute quicker. So the speeding is not really saving you a lot of time it makes you feel less rushed but you're not really changing it and act and that's make it safe and reduce the risk so walk around the entire unit is much better than than taking the shortcut um, turning it off may not be as easy an option um, depending on the piece of equipment you're using so it's following the rules around it walking around checking the surrounding looking for others making sure others can't get injured Stop, think, act is something you can use every day in every life. Um, it's as simple as getting on a ladder with stocking feet instead of putting shoes on. Um, we know what we should do and we don't always do it using this little process in your head. And I'm not saying take 10 minutes to do an analysis of the effort. Quickly in your brain, stop what was I told? How should I do it? Think of what they were supposed to do, what you could do to make it better. Is there something, is there a guard missing? That's the, You're still in stop mode. In fact, if you get to the point where you don't think you can do it safely, you stay in stop mode. You shouldn't go and act. Act is when you then go, okay, here's what the guy told me. Here's how I'm supposed to do the job. I think I can do it. I'm going to go ahead and act. And if you follow that, stop, think, act almost any day in your life for anything, you'll eliminate an awful lot of incidents that end up in what other people term as accidents. So I think I've got about one more slide here, Catherine, which puts us in pretty good time. I can get my clicker to work. Um, here we go. Um, tell me more. Learn about safety. There's lots of places you can go. Um, I've listed our website on there. Um, WSPS.ca. I should have put a slash farm safety on there. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody who's interested in COVID issues, we have got a large section on there. Just go WSPS slash either pandemic or COVID. Um, you can sort it by ag sector. Um, I think the province is bragged. We have something like 90 guidelines out there for COVID. 60 odd are from WSPS. Um, we've got about 40 fact sheets in there on following through on some incidents. There's some free online learning right now. Even with the COVID, we've turned around and made it free. Um, you can always ask your supervisor, ask your friends. Um, uh, uh, you can ask uh, co-op students. Always go and ask your teacher. Teachers have to inspect a workplace before co-op students go there. Mm -hmm. um, so go to your co-op teacher if you're not getting satisfaction. Um, there are three other health and safety associations in the province, so I'm not saying you have to work in agriculture, it's the best place to work, but um, <laughs> there is an infrastructure which is your construction and trucking um, and municipal services, there's a public service which is your education and healthcare um, and, and those groups and there's also a workplace safety north out of North Bay and they do the mining, forestry, the pulp and paper, those groups. We do industrial manufacturing and agriculture. So I always recommend to people when they go to our website, go to slash farm safety. And because if you don't, you're going to get it for everybody. Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, so I think that's, I'm ending there. Um, right. I think I've got one with questions and uh, I'm going to end it with that one. So if anyone wants, they can phone this number. Um, that will get you a customer care number. We actually have a consultant on call. Um, so every day there's a consultant who has to sit around their home and wait for you to call. Um, they can answer your questions. If it's distinctly around agriculture, regrettably, they may forward it to me. Um, oh, that's good. But that's um, good. I, I will get back to you. We have five or six consultants who 
have been working in agriculture distinctly for almost 20 years, mm. all of them. And some of them actually, we have about 11 consultants in our company that also are from farms. Okay. So I know we've got one, his dad's a beef farmer. So he, mm -hmm. you know, um, he helps his dad farm daily and weekends. <laughs> so just, just a couple of questions. That's great uh, resources to take a look at. Thanks for mentioning those, obviously, for those that will be listening to this. Uh, one of the things that did come in was in regards back to that hazard training. So how would you recommend keeping the hazard training engaging for employees in order to actually make them pay attention and truly learn and understand? the hazard I, I think and that's always a challenge um, I tend to in agriculture tell people don't try and do your training all in one day mm. um, so don't say on the first day we're going to do this and we're going to sue and we're going to go look at every piece of equipment and we're going to go this is everything that's possible mm -hmm. um, we tend to um, in agriculture work through a series or a process as we go so if you go to some place like a factory they have everything going on every day. In farming, we tend to go through, you know, our seeding season, our harvest season, um, our winter storage season, um, other than jobs like you know, dairy farming, which goes on every day, day after day, seven days a week. Um, so what I would do is tend to train for the things you're getting them to do. I would tend to do it with showing as much as possible try and keep it short, but demonstration. So if you can break into groups like maybe it depends on what type of business you're in, but if it's less than six employees at a time mm -hmm. and do demonstrate by showing, people will ask questions in smaller groups. They won't ask questions in a group larger than 15. They'll all sit there and nod their head at you. <laughs> and that's worse with a language issue. Right. So no matter what the second language, their first language is, their second language might be English, um, they will always ask less questions. So having them in a smaller group, you know, you can comprende, comprende. And, and if they're shaking their head this way, they don't comprende. So show them again, ask them what's wrong. Maybe someone in the group speaks a bit more Spanish than you do. Um, I know enough to get my face slapped, so I'm not a good trainer in Spanish. Um, but, you know, you can ask those kind of questions. If you can find a good YouTube video, a short video, like less than three minutes. So for donning and doffing PPE, for example, don't try and be the expert. Go to CDC US, find a video, show the video, and then ask if there's any questions. And then what I would do is I would ask them to do it. So you've been showing them a job and doing the job, you get them to do the job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a simple example of tying your shoes. It's hard to teach someone how to tie their shoe, especially when they're staring at you, they need to look at the same point of view you have. So having them show you they know how to tie their shoe. Right. Um, and whatever the job is, you pick the job. Um, but if they can't tie their shoe, then your training wasn't effective. Right, um, right. So, so then really, you really repetitive uh, steps broken down in order for people to make sure that they have comprehended. Yeah, supervi supervision, it has to be constant, but it doesn't have to be all the time. Sure. So you, during the first day, you might look back on the person every 30 minutes. On the second day, you might look back every 45 minutes. By the end of the week, you're going to check in every hour and make sure they're doing it properly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously correct the second you see them not doing it the way you told them. Because sure. bad habits become really hard to break. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's sort of what I try and do. And by breaking it off into little 15 minute spurts, you hold the attention span sure. um, of everybody. <laughs> um, I hope that helps a little bit. For yeah, the sure. You had mentioned about PPE, and that's obviously something that is of a uh, constant topic. Is that something right now that employees need to bring their own, or does the employer provide it? Is it different depending on the job? What are the rules around that? Uh, technically, it is the employer's responsibility to provide it. Mm -hmm. um, so for the example being steel toed shoes, you could, if you wanted to say that in the job description, we require steel toed shoes every day. Mm -hmm. um, what you can often do and some reply, uh, some guys do is they go to someone like Mark's work warehouse and get a discount card or something or, or pay a $50 gift certificate type thing. 
and say, if you need steel toes here, this will help cover some of the cost of the steel toes. Um, if it's, and usually in agriculture, we don't require steel toes for everything every day. So it's one of those things around the hazard. Um, something like COVID, I would say provide the hazard. Um, if it's something around, especially if it requires, uh, say a pesticide mask or something that's more than an N95, um, so a respirator with carbon, uh, carbon filters and those kind of things for, for insecticides, I would say the employer should provide it because the worker may tend to not maintain it and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Kevlar gloves for people with sharps, mm. I, I would tend to want to provide them. I would also provide them with very sharp knives or a sharpening system. Mm -hmm. Dull knives, accidents tend to happen with dull knives, not okay. sharp knives. Hmm. Um, so that, but in reality, it is a response. It's, it's, it's a known hazard in the workplace. The employer should provide, but PPE is also a last form of, re, of protection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, same thing, COVID is the example. Distancing is way better than PPE mm -hmm. because uh, you can infect yourself by not taking your mask off properly. Right. Not washing your hands properly, keeping distance and washing your hands and soap and water is better than sanitizer. Right. Um, you know, so you can protect yourself quite easily by trying to keep distance. Um, putting a barrier up is actually, you know, like Canadian tire plexiglass in front of you um, is actually better than wearing the PPE. Right. Um, and PPE can cause problems because think of this heat we've been having and wearing PPE. <laughs> so PPE is a last resort when you can't, for example, with COVID, keep your distance. Mm -hmm. um, so in reality, we require it internal in a lot of jobs because you just can't keep your distance. Okay. That leads into my final question around the heat. What are the current break requirements during times of <laughs> peak heat? And I think that's very timely, especially this uh, last week here in Ontario. Yeah. And um, I, I guess should have a, a link for you to send you to. Um, Heat's an interesting one because uh, there are no real good standards as to what is um, absolutely required. Um, in an industrial situation, they have some fancy equipment and use, you know, dry bulb and wet bulb and uh, calculate humidex factors and those kind of things. Um, I think the important feature is, and and there are some good, if you go to our website, there's actually some good material graphics sort of, this, sort of, and it tends to work on using that hum humidex factor. So our weather stations will tell us what our humidex is, and you can use that as your guidelines, and it'll say, you know, so long with a break or not a break. Um, if you go to OCOW's website, the Ontario, um, OCOW, Ontario Workers Clinics for Occupational Health and Safety. Um, it's OCOW, O-H-C-O-W. Yep. <laughs> okay. um, if you go to their website, they have some very good material that was done especially with the firefighters. Um, mm -hmm. They have big issues around heat stress and heat stroke. Um, and there's some very good material in there. Um, I think the thing to do is make sure that there's always access to shade. Um, there's lots of water. Um, plan your breaks. Um, and educate your everybody around what heat stress and heat stroke are. If you're not sweating, um, you're in trouble. If your neighbor next to you is not sweating, you could be in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that's sort of that internal responsibility and look after each other. And it could be 20 degrees with a higher humidex, and that could be worse than 25 with a low humidex. Because right. if you're not doing, your body's not doing the sweating cooling or can't sweat to cool, um, those are when you end up in trouble. And the trouble with heat stroke or heat stress is, is when person collapses, you need to get their body temperature down quickly. So understanding your first aid, um, if someone does go down, how you're going to respond quickly, because mm -hmm. you need to get their internal body core down. And that's the trouble firefighters have is they go into a fire and they come out and take a 20 minute break, sort of the same size as their oxygen tanks, but they're not cooled down in their body core right. after 20 minutes. They can't go back in. Right. Um, so that uh, right. they need to find a better way to cool down in between. Um, and, and that's the important factors. So yep. just taking the break is not as critical as getting cooled down and rehydrated. Okay. Oh, that's great. Uh, lots of really great live examples, true things that people can take into consideration with 
obviously agri-food workplace safety. And I think that you not only taught us the basics today, but went in, like I said, and gave us really good examples to utilize and to take into consideration. So thanks, Dean. We appreciate you being here from the Workplace Safety and Pre Prevention Services uh, group. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, obviously appreciate you pre presenting the webinar today and giving us the insight and knowledge. You'll actually see Dean join us again on Thursday, July 16th at 10 a.m. He will be uh, presenting the webinar with Mercedes from Agscape and it will be a unique opportunity for you as an employer to look at how if you have staff that are new to agriculture what kind of training and educating new employees in agriculture and food really require so we look forward to having you back again and appreciate you taking the time and obviously today has been made possible because of the partnership of the Feed Your Future program. I'll have you advance the slide there. That's excellent. Oh. Uh, Feed Your Future program is obviously a collaboration between OFA, Ag Careers and Careers and Food.com and we're providing webinars, virtual career fairs across the province, and it really allows an opportunity for job seekers to take a look into the agriculture and food industry and job opportunities that are available, information that they could be interested in. These here on the screen are some links to toolkits with lots of information and details around the Feed Your Future program and what is being offered. More specifically, the next slide shows some of the upcoming, um, some of the team members, but then some of the upcoming virtual career fairs. We just previously last week had a virtual career fair that was Ontario wide, and there was probably over 150 career opportunities, job opportunities that were highlighted by various employers. So we encourage you to take place and sign up for free on August 25th as a job seeker to check out multiple uh, job opportunities in, Oct in Ontario and there are some of the dates for the other virtual career fairs that are coming up. And then on the next slide just shows you some of the upcoming webinars. So I obviously mentioned the one on July 16th, that, which is this Thursday, and then there is a list of others. If you have questions though, I had mentioned at the beginning, we have a concierge service and you can connect with us through social, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And then we have these emails set up, which are feedyourfuture at agcareers.com or feedyourfuture at careersandfood.com. And we really appreciate the support of all of these partners in order to make this valuable information available in Ontario. And it will be accessible online at a further date if you would like to watch this recording again. So thanks again, Dean, for being with us today, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everyone.